right, so we are welcoming today Scott Harrison from Charity Water. And I'm really excited for all of us to hear his latest. Um, he is just a tremendous leader and he's become a good friend. And his mission is bringing clean drinking uh, water to people in developing countries. And today, Google.org and Googlers, our employees, have donated more than $8 million to advance the mission of Charity Water. So throughout today's talk, if you um, are inspired to make a donation, you can do that uh, on uh, the blue donate button underneath the YouTube chat. All right, so let's bring in Scott, our keynote speaker, and he's going to talk today about keep water flowing. And so after his talk, I'll interview him for a little bit, and then we're going to open up to questions from the audience. All right, Scott. All right. Hi, Jacqueline. How are you? Great. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity. So uh, I prepared like 100 pictures. So <laughs> awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into it, and, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to our conversation afterwards. So Sounds let me figure great. out how to share the screen here and um, jump into it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on World Water Day. Um, hopefully that worked. Um, I'm going to start just with a, with a little bit of backstory. Uh, that was my mom and my dad. I was born in Philadelphia into a middle class family. Uh, when I was four, uh, we moved into this really ugly gray house and unknown to us, there was a carbon monoxide gas leak in this house that would change uh, our family's kind of history forever. Uh, we moved in in winter. Uh, my dad started getting sick. I started getting sick. My mom started getting sick. And on New Year's Day, 1980, she collapsed unconscious, kind of the canary in the coal mine, uh, which led to a long series of blood tests and the discovery of the leak. And really life changed for me as a, as a four-year-old. And, and my mom became an invalid from that point on. She went from a healthy, vibrant, uh, super mom, a, a journalist uh, who had traveled around the world with my dad to a complete uh, invalid. Uh, she was allergic to the world from this point on. Her immune system just crashed and never came back. So I, I, I've been familiar with the 3M family of masks for about 41 years uh, and, and grew up with a mom connected to oxygen. I, I never really saw her face because she was wearing uh, one mask or another trying to just avoid exposure to, to all the chemicals that, that made her sick from this point. Um, very religious family, very conservative family. Uh, they brought me up in the church. I played piano every Sunday uh, and my parents didn't sue the gas company for negligence because they, they just didn't want to become bitter and they were, they were going to trust God that, that he would make sense of, of all this. So, you know, good kid, didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't sleep around, didn't cuss. And then 18 happened and I discovered that New York City was only two hours away. And I woke up and had my huge moment of my turn, uh, my rebellion, time to break the rules, time to you know give the church and religion the middle finger, move to New York City. And I, I discovered uh, this, this amazing, bizarre profession where I could really rebel in style. And that was a nightclub promoter. And I realized that this was a cool job in New York City where if you could get uh, beautiful, rich people inside the right clubs, you could make tons of money effectively partying for a living. And uh, I, you know, I was starting this gig at, at 18, 19, three years before I was even legally allowed to be in the clubs. And I spent the next 10 years, uh, to the, the horror of my parents, uh, working at 40 different nightclubs in New York City, drinking my way through the city, uh, as you can see here, pretentiously flashing a Rolex watch so that people thought I was important or, or had money or, you know, driving the BMW, all these, these markers of success that, that I've been trying to collect. And, uh, you know, it started out maybe a little more uh, innocuous and towards the end, it got pretty dark. There were a lot of drugs involved. There was a lot of gambling involved. There was pornography and strip clubs and just a kind of uh, really, you know, degenerate, hedonistic existence. So, you know, the club at 10, uh, after hours at three, and then, you know, popping Ambien at noon to, to try to come down. Um, and this picture that I, that I found really says it all. Like I hated myself. I hated my life. And I, I, I'd become this sycophant, this hedonist degenerate. So 
Okay, I won't make you look. Won't make you look at that photo anymore. Um, in uh, the fall of of two thousand and four, you know, I kind of hit bottom at the top. I was in South America on this amazing vacation, and I started thinking about my life. Uh, I started having some health issues. Maybe no surprise uh, after ten years of partying, and I asked myself the question: like, if I died, what would my life mean? You know, what would my tombstone potentially read? And the only thing I could come up with was, here lies a man who got a million people drunk, or, or worse, uh, a million people wasted. And I, I realized just kind of how, you know, slowly, but then suddenly, I had, I'd come so far from the, the foundation of, of morality and spirituality that my, my parents tried to bring me up with. I mean, I wanted to be a doctor when I was a kid. And here I was, you know, a drug-addled nightclub promoter. So I, um, I sold everything I owned, being a pretty radical guy, and said, I'm going to start life over at 28. I want to find purpose, and I want to give one year of my life away uh, to, to see if I can be useful. Can I be helpful? And, uh, you know, I applied to World Vision and Save the Children and Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross and uh, all these big orgs that I'd heard of. And uh, unfortunately, nobody would take me. So finally, one small organization in the 2004 said to me that if I was willing to live in post-war Liberia, which, if I'm honest, was a country I'd never heard of at the time, and if I was willing to pay them $500 a month to volunteer, then I could join their mission. So I was like, perfect. I mean, what's more opposite than having to pay to volunteer and actually going to, at that time, the the country on the very, very bottom of the United Nations um, development chart. So this is me at 28 with a bad haircut, quitting smoking, quitting drinking, quitting the drugs, trying to start life over, uh, joining a medical mission in Liberia backed by 14,000 United Nations peacekeepers, which at the time was the largest force deployed in the history of the world. So uh, my new home became a 522 foot converted cruise liner that had been gutted and turned into a hospital. And it was a very simple idea. Uh, th this group brought the best doctors and surgeons from all over the world. They sailed the ship up and down the coast of Africa, trying to help people who had no access to medical care. And I was joining as the photojournalist. So I was gonna document all of the medical surgeries for the, for the library, the, the medical library, and, and hopefully they could use my stories and my pictures to raise money and raise awareness. So I, I had never experienced anything like Liberia before. The whole country was shot up. Uh, there was no electricity in the country. There was no running water. There was no sewage system, and there was no mail system. So you could not send a letter to a person in a country of millions of people. Everything was broken from the war. And notably, there was one doctor for every 50,000 people living there. And I, I think our ratio in America is about one to 300. Uh, so if you got sick in the country, you were out of luck. And, and that's why uh, we, were, we were there to, to help. So we would flyer the country in advance of the ship's arrival. And a small advance team would say, hey, look, if you have a facial tumor or if you have flesh-eating disease, if you were born with a cleft lip or a cleft palate or you were burned during the war maybe, and, and you need facial reconstruction, turn up and our doctors will try to see you. And I, I learned that the government had given us a football arena, a soccer stadium in the center of town to screen the patients. And my third day there, I took this picture of the more than 5,000 sick people that came to see our doctors. Now there was a problem. We didn't have 5,000 surgery slots, we had 1,500 surgery slots. So we actually sent 3,500 people home that day without help, without the ability to see a medical professional because we didn't have enough resources. I later learned many of the people that you see in this crowd had walked for more than a month just hoping to see a doctor, some of them bringing their kids from neighboring countries like Sierra Leone or Cote d'Ivoire or, uh, or Guinea. Um, the first child that I met and photographed was a 14-year-old boy named Alfred. And he was effectively suffocating to death on a benign tumor. Uh, his mom was very smart. She got him there four days early. She pulled out a photo and said, this was my son at 10. Healthy boy. 
And then this tumor started growing. There was no surgeon to take him to or hospital. So we took him to the local witch doctor. None of that worked. And that was my job for a, for a year that I was paying $500 a month to, to do. And I, I met 1,500 patients like Martha Lean, who, who told me that for eight years, this tumor slowly grew and that people would stone her. They would throw rocks at her face if they ever saw her tumor. So she would have to walk around covering it up. And what she needed was a 40 minute surgery just to remove a, a very benign mass and get her face and her dignity and, and her life back. So it was, an, it was an incredible experience. That first year I took 50,000 photos and I'm blasting my club list of about 15,000 emails. Uh, back then open rates were almost 100%. So, you know, like it or not, you went from getting invited to the Prada party to images of leprosy and tumors and cleft lips. And of course, a few people unsubscribed. Most people were curious, they were interested. Uh, they said, how do we send money to help for uh, a surgery like this? How do we come on the ship and volunteer? So I learned that maybe the same skills that I developed packing clubs, selling $25 cocktails or $800 bottles of champagne to, to Goldman guys, you know, could be used to in a more redemptive, positive uh, way that helps people. So I went back for a second year to Liberia. And that's where I found what would be my life's issue or, or, or my work. Um, I learned that dirty water was causing most of the sickness we were seeing. And I learned two things, that half of the country was drinking from swamps and ponds and rivers like this. And then I learned half the disease in the country was because people were drinking dirty, contaminated, unsafe water. And they didn't have access to hygiene and sanitation. So... Uh, Long story short, there's a lot more there, but in that second year, I just went deeper and deeper. I learned about the 26 diseases associated with water. So I, I came back to New York City. I was broke. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd given up the vices, so I didn't smoke or drink or party anymore. But I, I really had this clear vision. Uh, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be instrumental in bringing clean water to everyone on earth, every single human. So the mission would be accomplished when no one on planet Earth had to drink dirty water, had to risk their life simply because of the, the situation they were born into. So, you know, as, uh, as we sit here on, on World Water Day, you know, tuning in from, from all over the world or, or watching this later, uh, we are a long way away from mission accomplished. So the 785 million people, about one in 10 people breathing air today on the planet, drinking unsafe water. And 82% of those people live in rural, remote areas. And I've now been to 69 different countries. I've been to Africa 65 or 70 times. And if, if you were to come with me, you would see things that would shock you. You would see kids like John Bosco in Rwanda drinking brown, viscous water, water that was alive. Uh, you would see uh, a girl in, in Honduras drinking from a muddy stream that ran in front of her home. And, and the water would look more to you like chocolate milk than anything you would ever consider drinking or giving to a loved one or, or a child. Um, there, As I mentioned, there's 26 different diseases we can directly relate to water. Obviously, you've all heard of cholera, which can kill you in a couple days. Uh, e. coli, which I've had several times, which is nasty. A schistosomiasis, fancy word for parasites or or worms, but there's a huge, huge health implication uh, on, on your family, your community, if you don't have clean water. Um, I, I met this girl in, in Eastern Kenya and she was drinking from the Molo River. And every time she would drink from this bottle, she would vomit on herself. She would drink and then she would throw up. And I remember just watching this in horror. I, honestly, asking myself how I could live in a world where I could experience this. And I used to sell $10 bottles of Voss water in nightclubs to people who would buy the water and not even open it because they were drinking booze instead. And uh, huge health problems. Education, uh, there's a huge link here. You know, one out of every three schools on the planet not only doesn't have clean water, also doesn't have toilets. So imagine sending your teenage girl to school with, without water without sanitation, without hygiene. And this is why so many girls drop out throughout the developing world. 
many of them are walking six hours for water with 40 pounds of dirty, useless, contaminated water on their backs, not getting educated, not leading their communities or their countries forward into the future. And I guess the last thing I'd say just briefly, it is, it is a women and girls issue. You know, everywhere I've traveled, whether I'm in India or Southeast Asia or Central or South America or Africa, it is the women and the girls that are marginalized trying to get right here, as you can see, to the eye of a stream, a spring in Ethiopia. And these women are, they're ankle deep in cow feces, in cow urine. They have kids on their back, but they're, this is the only water in, in Gazi Springs, Ethiopia, where all of them lived. <clears throat> this woman was digging in a sandy riverbed in Kenya, telling me that if she got deep enough, she, she hoped to find water. These women uh, told me their, their biggest fear was crocodile attacks. And they listed the names of women who had actually come to this village and, <clears throat> and been attacked and dragged off by, by crocodiles. So it's a huge problem. It's a human problem affecting 785 million people uh, around the world. Um, and the great thing about it is it's a solvable problem. So there's not a single person we don't know how to help. There's not <clears throat> one person right now where we're scratching our heads saying, we don't know how to bring that person access to clean water. <clears throat> and uh, we've always taken a solution agnostic approach. So there's no silver bullet. There's no one size fits all solution. But a lot of different things work in a lot of different environments and you can always get clean water as an end result. So um, we fund 14 technologies now, I'll just share one. For about $12,000, we can bring about a million dollars of drilling equipment into a village and find uh, the local skilled hydrogeologists to know how to tap into that water and find the clean water underground. And it is one of the most amazing moments that you would ever experience in your life being surrounded by a thousand people who have never had clean water and for $12,000 uh, tapping into the massive aquifer, the massive lake that was underneath, uh, in this case, a school where 1,500 kids went <clears throat> and never had access to clean water. Um, it's a celebration. There's clapping, there's dancing. Uh, this never gets old. Uh, this is a community in Malawi, <clears throat> excuse me, that actually built the road for three months to allow the rig to access the village. Um, we, we don't have a, a slogan of Charity Water, but if we did, it would be water changes everything. It's just the most transformative thing on the planet. <clears throat> it, uh, it impacts health. Obviously, it impacts education. When you can bring clean water and, and, and sanitation to schools, you get better students. There's an incredible amount of data now behind this. Uh, it impacts women and girls, and you get these incredible stories of women taking the reclaimed time and starting small businesses, uh, earning an extra dollar or two dollars a day, selling rice at the market or selling peanuts. Or, or many women just say, we use this time to spend more time with our kids to lead our families and our communities forward into, into the future. So water is just an amazing thing to do. Uh, there's, again, data that's come out of the UN since we started on the economic impact of bringing water and sanitation to, to people. Uh, there was an 88 page pay, uh, paper uh, that found every dollar invested yielded four to eight times economic return. So it's just a good thing to do. And it's really one of the few things that I think everybody believes in. You know, whether you are on the, uh, the left or the right politically, uh, whether you care about religion, whether religion is anathema to you, uh, regardless of what you might think of, of any of the social issues or, or argument points of the day, every single person can come together and believe in clean water for humans. Yet I've been at this almost 15 years. No one has told me to stop. No one has said, Scott, we think kids should be dying of bad water. We think women should be raped on their six hour walk to, to the faraway river. Right? No, no one believes that. So you're, you're able to bring uh, a lot of diverse people together who might fight about 95% of other things and you can get people to agree on clean water. It's also binary. Right? Clean water is, is clean or dirty. It's just not a subjective outcome. And, uh, and that's allowed us uh, you know, to, to build a pretty big tent. Okay, charity water. Um, 
So it's World Water Day. I'll just kind of finish by telling you a little bit of the model and how we've tried to, to make an impact. So it was a startup story. This was the couch in New York City where it all started. Uh, I just come off the Mercy ship. I was 30. I was living on a, a closet floor at the time for free rent. But I had, um, I had the vision. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring clean water to everybody on earth before I died or as many people uh, as I could and take all of my time and energy and passion uh, singularly focused on this. Now, I had the advantage of being 30. So I was just talking to friends that worked at MTV or VH1 or Sephora or Chase Bank. And I realized most of my friends did not trust charities. Uh, they didn't trust the big names. They all seemed to have a, a story of scandal or nepotism or you know money mismanagement. And I, I learned there was real data behind this. USA Today found 42% of Americans said they did not trust charities. And a, a new uh, newer study by NYU Wagner found 70% of people believe charities wasted their money, right? Seven out of 10 people believe that when they made a donation, it was wasted in part or, or in whole. So I thought this is a huge opportunity to do something different, to reach out to these cynical, skeptical, disenchanted people and try to bring them back to the table try to get them excited. So the, the biggest idea I had was uh, I was going to try to reinvent charity and nobody was using social entrepreneur at the time or disruption, any of that. I was just trying to do something different when it came to, to charities. And I thought, what if I could promise the public that 100% of every donation they ever gave would go directly to help people get clean water? And, you know, of course, you're sitting there thinking like, most people like, well, how would you pay for an overhead? How would you ever pay for salaries or an office? And I said, we're going to do that separately. So for a couple hundred dollars in each, I opened up two bank accounts with different numbers. They would be audited separately. And we would make this promise that 100% of every penny, pound, euro, kroner we ever raised would go straight to help people get clean water. And I would take it upon myself to raise the overhead from a small group of people who wouldn't mind paying those unsexy costs. So that was kind of pillar number one. The second was then just realizing that because money wasn't fungible, we could use the emerging technology to track donations and show people where they were. And I remember meeting the founder of Google Earth. Charity Water and Google Earth, Google Maps started around the same time. And I told him what I was doing and he he, uh, he, he basically said, I'm, I'm building something where you will be able to geolocate every water point Charity Water ever funds in the world. And we became the first charity to, to do that, to make every water point that we ever funded transparent on Google Earth at first and then later on Google Maps. So you can actually go and see the satellite images of these wells. And we would, we would make all this data public and we would hold ourselves accountable and we would try to build... The, the most transparent charity that the world had ever seen. The, the third pillar was just to this belief that for the work to be culturally appropriate and for it to be you know, sustainable in the long run, uh, a guy like me should not be running around Africa or India or Cambodia with a hard hat. Um, a guy like me could hopefully raise some money efficiently, get people to care, maybe get some companies involved, but the work had to be led in each country by the locals. They would get the credit. Uh, they would fly the flag of, of development in each of these countries. And our role would be to build their capacity, help them buy more drilling rigs, help them hire more local hydrogeologists. So we would be a funder and a partner, uh, but across the, the countries where we would work on, it would always be locally led. So we put those three things together. The only idea I had uh, 14 years ago was to throw myself a party in a nightclub. I gave everybody open bar. 700 people turned up for the open bar and a, and a new club during Fashion Week in New York. And I made them all donate $20 on the way in. And that night we raised 15,000 in cash. We took 100% of the money to a refugee in Northern Uganda and we, we fixed a few wells. We rehabbed them. And then we sent the photos and the GPS coordinates back to those 700 people. We sent video of clean water flowing and we said, you came and people now have clean water because you gave $20. Here is where your money went. And the feedback loop we got was so positive. We said, we're on to something. Let's keep building this donor feedback into everything the organization does. 
And maybe we can restore trust. Maybe if people knew that their money was making a difference, they would continue to be generous. Uh, we, we tried to get creative. We actually uh, launched this exhibition at Chelsea Market. So this was under Google headquarters uh, in Chelsea uh, several years ago. It was seen by over a million people. And we just shot wealthy people uh, in New York City in the same situations as the, the people we were seeing around the world. Uh, kids that go to private school that cost $40,000 a year. Uh, my banker friends uh, I sent up to, to Central Park Pond to collect water in their Brioni suits. Just trying to get people to think differently about water, to get people to think differently about the absence of water, this thing that so many of us just take for granted because we have never not known water, water everywhere. Um, we put dirty water in baby bottles and asked uh, parents to, to imagine potentially killing your child which is what kills thousands of kids every single day and having no other option. But that's the only water you've ever known. That's the only water available. And through these campaigns, we wound up getting donated media on buses, uh, a thousand taxis uh, around the country to, to you know, just spread awareness. Um, we tried to break down what donations did. So this is what $12,000 buys in Ethiopia. So if you were to write a check for a whole well, we go out and buy PVC and pipes, and that's the drilling team uh, that, that would drill one of those wells. If you wrote a $10,000 check for a project in Cambodia, it would buy a completely different set of materials for a completely different solution. So always just looking for interesting ways to kind of to bridge the gap, to show people what their donations were doing. We, we partnered creatively with luxury retailers. We got to take over the windows of Saks Fifth Avenue in New York. And in Chicago and Beverly Hills, uh, Saks eventually let me build wells inside the stores, just talking about this issue to, to a luxury customer. Uh, we got to partner with brands like American Express, who put us on their homepage for a few months and, and took out a million dollar print campaign, just talking about the work of Charity Water. And we've gotten to work uh, with, with some really interesting companies and brands over the years on, on bespoke campaigns to raise awareness, to raise money. Um, and Google's notably missing here, but I'm about to talk about the, the coolest thing that we did uh, with, with you. Um, social was really important to us. First charity to get a million followers. Uh, first charity to use Instagram. We were always looking for ways to celebrate our community. We would say, look at them. Look at the volunteers. Look at the passion. Look at the compassion of the people around the world that are, are taking up this issue. And, and you know, we believe that the movements of the future would, would grow on, on social. Maybe you're asking who pays the overhead. Long story there, a lot of starts and stops, but we built a really sophisticated multi-year, multi-tier giving program called The Well. And we asked entrepreneurs and business leaders to commit 100 grand a year up to a million a year. And we said, you have to commit at least three years so we can plan cash flow and, and we can plan our growth. And we found 125 entrepreneurs and families to do that. We went to Johnny Ive and Angela Aarons at Apple. We went to people at Uber. We went to Jack at Twitter. We went to Daniel at Spotify. Uh, we went to Chris Saka. We went to people in, in, in business um, at, at Goldman Sachs or at LinkedIn or people in the fashion world. And we even went to people in, in sports and entertainment. And it's a diverse group from Tyler Perry to Depeche Mode. Uh, finding 125 backers to cover the overhead costs so the char Charity Water could continue to give 100% away. Okay, what I'm so excited about, the, the Google piece. So um, it started out with this promise to put everything up on Google Earth and Google Maps. And then um, as we started scaling around the world, we wanted to do better than that. So we started putting GPS trackers on our drilling rigs and building maps for them. Uh, putting our rigs on Twitter so they would tweet their location and people could track them. And then as we scaled across 20 some countries, um, I began to get really concerned about this problem, the problem of broken wells. And there's a bunch of data out there that says up to 40% of the world's wells are broken, but no one knows which 40%. And I wondered whether data, whether technology could help us solve this problem. And uh, I, I, I pitched Jacqueline and her team. I said, I've, I've got this crazy idea. You know, the internet of things was, was, was starting at the time. And I said, what if we could create a smart well? 
What if we could create a remote sensor that we could drop in Somalia or Eritrea or, or Ethiopia that would connect a well to the cloud and self-report its functionality so that if a well broke like this, it would trigger an alarm system. And uh, that was the challenge. You know, a rural community gets a hand pump. Sometimes the maintenance is out of their reach and it's hard to find the, the reliable service providers. So we wanted to make maintenance possible. We wanted to know that when we built a well, it would last for a decade. And um, Jacqueline and her team took a, a big gamble on us. Uh, they wrote us a $5 million check for this, uh, this, this innovative idea out of the, the Impact Awards. And we got to work. We worked with 22 labs around the world working on R&D for what would be the first rural water sensor of its kind ever in the world. No one had ever bothered to do this. Uh, we made the AfroDev sensor version one, and we went and we retrofitted 3,500 of our wells in Ethiopia. And we managed to get the sensor cost under $150. <clears throat> so you've got a $12,000 asset and a $150 sensor with a 10 year battery life that can connect to the cloud and let us know that water is flowing. The minute we did that pilot, we got the largest data set in the history of the world when it comes to rural water supply. Um, so what we're able to do with the wells that are connected, and we're now over 7,500 connected projects, is tell a donor not just where the project they funded through their donations or through their birthday is, not just show them uh, a GPS data or, or the, the, uh, the, the amount that the well costs uh, or a satellite image of it, but now five or seven or even 10 years later after that funding, we can show them the daily flow rates. And we've uh, been able to learn a lot through this data, even how a well is used throughout the period of the day. And we're working on some AI stuff now that can hopefully predict the failure of wells uh, and, and basically dispatch preemptive mechanics, preemptive maintenance teams. So uh, this has been one of the most exciting projects. Uh, we, we've, we've worked really hard on this. It's been unbelievably challenging. Uh, there was nothing like this out in the sector. And uh, we're now working on version two of the AfroDev, version one of the pipe sensor, and version one uh, of an India Mark II, which is a completely different one. So just one little fun fact. Uh, now we know how much water our wells are producing. And just imagine you know, making an investment for 12 grand and knowing that that was pumping 1,500 liters of clean water a day or half a million liters every year. You know, If you were to go to the deli or a bodega, you would pay two bucks. So that's a million dollars if you were to buy the water uh, the way that we value it here uh, every single year. And if we can prove a 10 year lifespan, you know, uh, imagine saying, hey, look, for $12,000, you know, we can guarantee what half a, uh, you know, 5 million different liters, uh, liters of clean water coming out. So, okay, I'm wrapping up here. In 14 years, uh, we, we've been driving really hard. We just crossed over the half a billion dollars raised mark. Um, the last couple of years pre-COVID were in a period of really, really nice growth. When we pivoted our business model to subscription in Q4, of 2016. Uh, COVID hit us pretty hard, but uh, we managed to kind of claw back to, to even and get uh, enough for 1.5 million new people to, to get clean water. This year, we'll, we'll do over 100 million, we hope, um, and get back on the, the growth trajectory. And uh, in total, you know, it, since we started, we've now been able to get 11.6 million people access to clean water. Uh, we employ over 1,400 locals across 22 different countries. Uh, through 44 uh, really great partners. We've got only about 95 people in New York and, and now distributed. And, uh, you know, looking back, obviously, uh, I'm glad I left this guy behind. Uh, I don't get invited to speak at Google if I'm, uh, if I'm this guy. And I've really been blessed with, with an amazing family. I got to work with my wife uh, for the first nine years at, at Charity Water. This is my wife, Victoria, who was our second employee and our creative director, and, uh, you know, I get to travel around and invite people to be a part of the clean water story. Um, if you're interested, I wrote a book uh, recently called Thirst. I gave all the advance and the proceeds away uh, to the organization so I can never make a penny from this. Uh, it wound up doing, doing pretty well and, and being endorsed by um, a bunch of really amazing people and, and people I respect. 
Um, so if you're looking for the 100,000 word story, there, there's obviously more there. Um, but just to kind of you know bring it home, 11.6 million people is, um, you know, it's a lot of people. Uh, it would fill up uh, Madison Square Garden 650 times. It would fill up Oracle Arena, you know, almost 595 times. So it's, it, it's an impact. But most of the time, uh, myself and our whole team is, is just focused on the work that is left to do. And when you put the people we've helped against the people who are waiting, uh, who, who need help, who are drinking dirty water today on World Water Day, you know, we've done what, 167th or so of, of the work that needs to be done. So we are focused on the future. We believe the best is yet to come. Uh, clean water is more important than ever. Certainly during a global pandemic, we've all been told to wash our hands. And our work has continued through COVID-19 around the world out there educating with masks on, building hand washing stations, uh, drilling wells, uh, just masked up and distant, uh, putting sensors on wells, repairing them, and then connecting them to the cloud so we know the next time that a well breaks. And one of my favorite photos uh, from, from Ethiopia, uh, seeing people uh, learn about hygiene and sanitation and how to keep themselves safe uh, during during the global pandemic with with really fragile healthcare systems. So um, I'm about to turn it back to Jacqueline, but you know we've got the UN goal now, goal six, uh, obviously doing water impacts goals five and four and three. and we're we're going for it. So we've got a vision now to help the next twenty five million people get clean water. We're trying to raise one point two billion dollars, and we're trying to do it. Uh, in a grassroots th way through as many small donations as possible. So um, no hard ask here, but if, if you're interested, we have an amazing subscription giving program. It's called The Spring. Um, we anchor at $40 a month, which is what it costs to get one person access to clean water. Uh, it's the only subscription where you get nothing in, in, in return. It's not like YouTube Red or Spotify or Dropbox or you know Amazon Prime. 100% uh, of the money goes straight to, to people in need. And we've built some really cool product tools, tracking impact. Um, everybody has an affiliate link. So if you share it with a friend, you get to kind of see uh, the, the impact of, of your whole family there. So uh, we share stories and videos and impact from the field. So we don't ghost our members. We're, we're really active um, trying to close the loop. And we've now grown to 147 countries. And and. Uh, YouTube is actually one of the biggest growth drivers for us uh, of the spring. It's helped us bring in tens of thousands of new members around the world. So um, I'm going to turn it back to, to Jacqueline, but uh, if you're interested in learning more, there are videos online. Uh, if you're willing to uh, join us on World Water Day, there's there's no better time to to join the movement. And you could go to thespring.com or, uh, or charitywater.org and, uh, and learn a lot more. So I'm going to stop there and uh, stop sharing and, and thank you all for, for letting me tell a little of my story. Scott, I have heard that story so many times, but every time I, it just fires me up and it makes me just so, so excited about your work. And I can still see the nightclub promoter in you. <laughs> and, you know, thank God, thank God you made that career transition. And we, we do need people with all sorts of skill sets to come to the social impact sector. But um, I want to start, I'm going to ask a few questions and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Great. Um, but let me just um, ask you about the technology aspect because we we are here at Google, and um, I just want you to be honest about it though. Like I think one of the things Google.org looks for when we partner is a nonprofit who really understands technology, is willing to take some informed risk. We consider our philanthropic capital risk capital. Um, but it wasn't always pretty. Uh, I remember in the early days of, of uh, trying to get the sensors to work. So maybe just like a real, some, some realistic thoughts about yeah, incorporating technology. It's so hard. It's so hard. So, you know, kind of moment in time, it took us, what, three times longer probably than we thought. Um, you know, the good news is we have now gotten seven million of follow on funding. So Google's not like the only one that was kind of capital <laughs> at the beginning. Um, but now as we're working on different sensors, uh, for different regions of the world. We've gotten other people to fund that R&D. Um, he, here's the hardest thing. I mean, in a way, I mean, the technology is really hard when you're not a technology company or a product-driven company. I mean, so we've got people flying back and forth to China and molding and tooling and, you know, 
I mean, who knew that a mold was so expensive for anything? I mean, right? So you're learning a whole new business. One of the biggest challenges for us is that our sensor only brings bad news. So you and I have talked about this, but as we think about adoption, right? In, in the absence of information, every charity is well is working forever until someone says it isn't. So the, the sector's kind of MO, and, 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 and I'm not being really critical, it's just been kind of drill and leave. You go and drill a bunch of wells and you hand them over to the community, you do a training, and then you say, okay, we want this to be sustainable, now it's on you. But if 40% of them break, you know, you're, you're, you're stranding 40% of your assets. So it's been a little bit of a dance. We're really excited. I don't even think I told you this, but we got the government of Ghana now. Uh, Charity Water has never worked in Ghana. So we have not built a single water project in Ghana, but they've now taken a thousand of our sensors and they're installing them on government pumps. So the Ghanaian water minister is now trying to use this to hold other people accountable in the country. So I think that's the, the the big idea is that you do find good actors and right. I mean, if I told you, hey, a well isn't 10 grand, but it's 20 grand and we can guarantee it for 20 years, people would rather pay 20 grand. So it's it's the information that's missing. So I'm, I'm really bullish on this kind of technology uh, in the future. But, yeah. you know, one of the things we talked about how you've been an um, innovator when it comes to technology and actually delivering clean water. But you've also been an innovator when it comes to doing the nonprofit sector. And I think that stat you started with, which just the low trust levels that people have, um, you know, we have so many resources. And I often talk to people, especially uh, in the, across the tech industry. Who, who have this hesitancy to give because they just don't have the trust. So maybe just speak to us a bit too about your whole philosophy, what you've learned from your model of 100% and proof and transparency. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm really hesitant to recommend the 100% model to others because it's, <laughs> it's tough, right? I don't want them to blow up and then blame me. Yeah. I mean, it's incredibly difficult, right? Because you have these two bank accounts, you have to run them in perfect balance. For example, if we raise too much money this year for the water projects, but not enough for the staff account. Like we we would we, right, we could go bankrupt with hundred million dollars in in the bank because these accounts don't don't touch each other. So you're doing this delicate dance. We've managed to make it work for 14 years and actually, you know, grow this base of overhead donors who love it. They love paying UI UX designers. They love paying software engineers. They love paying you know the toner for the Epson copy machine because they know that it's an efficient, high growth organization that's transparent. Right, they're buying into you know the overall story, um, but I look. I I just think donors want to know where their money goes, and they want to know like people are open to myriad value propositions. If I told everybody on this call right now that I don't know, let's say the front door of our office was broken and we needed a thousand dollars to fix it, people would come up with that money to meet that need like that, right? They just want to know like where is it going. And I think it's the opacity of the sector that has turned a lot of people off, right? Let me put in the fine print during the disaster relief moment that pst, we can use your money for the endowment, right? We can sit on this and earn interest for 50 years on that five or 10 bucks that you're texting. And, you know, I, I remember a story once, I think it was Doctors Without Borders during the tsunami, they over raised and they raised millions more than they could deploy. And they wrote those donors and said, we need to return your money. And what do you think 99% of the donors said? Keep our money. But thank you for telling us, right? Thanks for being straight. Thanks for saying that, that you can't use it. So I think it's just, this is kind of basic stuff. It's just integrity, it's trust, and it's looking for ways to use technologies to connect people, to make the world feel smaller, um, to connect a donation and say, this is this is where it went. These are the people that were helped, who were helped. Okay, Scott. So we're going to open up to audience questions now. Let's see if we've got any in the hopper. Okay, so Jamie, how can eager and willing people help Charity Water more beyond donating? Or uh, do you take I, do you take skills based volunteering? Are 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 people like you in on the taking the photographer traveling the world, traveling to Liberia? Do you do that now? We we have some people that we've worked with freelancers. I mean, listen, any anybody at Google is probably going to get a different answer than. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know, Jamie. Shoot shoot us an email. Um, yeah. 
you know, we, we have internships. Um, you know, I will say this. Most times that that question comes at us like, can I go drill a well in Africa? And the answer to that is always no. Um, I have never drilled a well in Africa in 15 years, nor has any member of our core team. Like we really believe that uh, the work has to be locally led. So when I bring people to the field and I've gotten to, you know, to bring some really amazing people, I'm like, you ask questions, you sit back, you learn so that you can come back and be an advocate for the local leaders. Yeah. Right? So that you can talk, you can be an advocate for the local women in this village, you know, who are going to explain their experience to you. But I don't need you to wear a hard hat or like, you know, jump in a well and, and do a photo op. Yeah. So um, we, we, we do. And, you know, every once in a while, we've got a data product or, or engineering where, where we can use some outside help. So yeah. um, reach out for sure. All right. Next question. Oh, my gosh. Pablo. Pablo. Pablo was uh, was our former head of product and uh, is one of the most amazing people that I've gotten to work with. So, um, well, Pablo and sometimes it works where we send our people over to yeah, you and our partners. Sometimes our people come over here for a season, but I think that's actually a good revolving door to get more people from the tech sector into the social sector, vice versa. But go ahead, yeah. specific question. Well, Pablo, Pablo specifically helped us uh, when we were working on the the birthday program, and uh, and and get that to you know get get that as as robust as we could. <laughs> um, the war into gray. So you know, you're, it feels like you're either following this and you're really deep in it and you know how unbelievably um, dire the, the situation is. Um, and some people are like, where's DeGray? Um, so it, this is this is actually the largest focus of Charity Water's work. Uh, it's, it's in the north of Ethiopia um, and it has been a, a terrible, terrible conflict uh, that's happened. And it is impacting our work. We've invested almost a hundred million dollars into gray. We have eight drilling rigs. There's 350 locals working on charity water projects. Um, and it has been, it has been a terrible, terrible situation. Uh, there's been looting, uh, there's been violence, there's been ethnic conflict, um, people coming over from Eritrea, from other parts. It's, uh, geopolitically complex. And, um, I, I, unfortunately I don't exactly know how it's going to end. And I think this this conflict could go on for for a while. So, you know, we're we're working a lot behind the scenes on remediation. We're we're trying to figure out how to go out and repair uh, some of the broken water systems. The the stories that are are coming in from, from our partners there are are shocking. Um, kids kids drinking from you know from the swamps and the rivers. I mean, this is an area where we've made so much progress. I've been just to this region in Tigray thirty one times over the last fourteen years. I mean, I would go two, three, four times a year, and uh, we're we're hoping that you know the the government and the the international community can continue to put pressure just to bring peace um, to and, and allow the humanitarian aid groups in. So it's it's deeply, deeply affected our work. We've paused our biggest program there. We've been redirecting resources and assets to to other countries, mm -hmm. and we don't really know how bad things are because of the security concerns. So there'll probably be a huge relief effort um, when when things stabilize there. Okay. Thanks, Pablo. Good to see you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Pablo. Do we have another question from the audience? Pia wants to know, um, Charity Water is a very innovative donation model and marketing, while many other charities still operate in a more traditional way. What do you think is needed to get more charities to this state? Well, I would say that most of the young charities that are – uh, the, the newer charities, they get this. I mean, look at Kiva, look at Watsi, look at New Story. You know, you you pick a charity started in the next in the last five to seven years, and their website looks better than ours. You know, I mean, <laughs> their, their their UI is good. They they look good on mobile. They're getting a lot of this stuff right. Um, I think you know, the bigger the ship, maybe the harder it is to to steer it. Yeah. And a lot of, I mean, Jacqueline, this is your experience. I mean, you come out of you know, a, a very traditional world. I think a lot of people that lead these big organizations, they're program people, they're engineers. You know, they think programmatically. They, they, they think um, maybe they don't think with a marketing brain on it. And, and it's not as simple as just hiring awesome storytellers or marketers or designers because great storytellers and marketers and designers don't want to work for someone that doesn't get it and value it. Right. So you, you really need to teach it at the top 
and you need those aha moments to come at the senior leadership, I think, to yeah. move the, the big orgs. And then just to create a culture where, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm like pixel pushing sometimes at 12.30 a.m. And, you know, uh, commenting on, you know, how our site looks bad on mobile or this page needs to change or, you know, move this button here or there. So that allows us to just attract people who are really good, who know that we care, like we value this at the organization. The user experience, the customer experience is, it matters. And we're only able to raise money to do good work by building a, grant, a great brand, building trust. And, you know, I mean, you know, you can join the spring in less than 20 seconds. I tried to join a monthly giving program the other day. I was like six minutes in and like nine pages. <laughs> and I wound, up closing the, I wound up closing Chrome. I'm like, I, I just don't think I have the time to go through this. Yeah. Well, it also points out how important it is to have a whole range of skill sets, right? I get, I get asked all the time from people, hey, I'm interested in taking a season where I'd like to focus on social impact full time, but you know, I'm just an engineer, or I'm, you know, I'm just a, a data analytics person, or I'm just in marketing. And it's, you know, uh, the impact sector needs all of these skills. You know, if you're great in HR, uh, you know, also really needed. So yes, yeah, right, and well, I, I think the more you give, the more you give. So I would just encourage everybody, you know, look for ways to give your money, to give your time, to give your talents and, you know, look for maybe re resist that urge to say no or to kind of put up the defenses because I don't know. I mean, the more stuff that we, that my wife and I get involved in, like, I feel like we get to live vicariously through all these amazing causes and some we give money to, some we give advice to. Um, she teaches a nonprofit subscription course, like she'll give out free codes to people like you know, I don't know. I just think we have we have so much, and I, I hate the fact that some people are cynical, and you know that all of these resources are are going to waste. I mean, Jacqueline, the one thing I will say is one of the biggest things that kills me is how little money we have raised. I mean, I I know a lot of billionaires. I know people that have started gaming companies and sold them for over a billion dollars in less than half the time that I've been trying to get clean water to the planet, right? Like it took me 15 years and a hundred speeches a year and 96 flights, I think the year before COVID, like, and, and I've raised half a billion dollars only. I mean, that's not real money yeah. in, in, in the grand scheme of things in, in, you know, in the Google world, in the, in the tech world. So I hope the best is yet to come. I'm, you know, I, I believe sometimes you have to build it for it to come. Maybe you just have to show up for a long time and just keep, you know, keep grinding. But I, I really hope we can have a bigger impact. And I think, you know, the spring and look, I mean, Disney Plus has 92 million people in what, a year? Like surely Charity Water should be able to get millions of people to care about clean water and give Scott, and you in charge, with you in charge i'm sure they're going to do it and and look the irony is that it's not just the moral imperative and and the fact that the huge impact that clean water has on on real lives and women and children and girls disproportionately but research also shows that people individuals human beings are actually much, much happier when they give their money yes. away you know there's just yes. an amazing literature that shows that if you actually are motivated by thinking about your own well-being and happiness um especially when you have a few shekels to rub together you know it's it's amazing uh that the research says it's actually going to make you happier too so that's that's a good well, virtuous look, look there. let's encourage everyone to give i early on in covid uh we we were out of the city and i was at a walmart and i got to pay 130 dollars for the person behind me who had a big family and I'm like, I didn't, and, and I, she had lost her job. She worked, she had just overheard a conversation. She worked in a car dealership and it was like one of the most amazing things that I was able to swipe my credit card for $131 and do something unexpected for a family. So, you know, this isn't, this doesn't have to be like international and global all the time. You can, you can right. look at your neighbors, you can look at your community, you can look at a checkout line at the supermarket and say, who looks like they need a little bit of help? Let me just anonymously pay. I mean, the, the woman was like in tears and, you know, it was, it was $130. You know, that's not, I didn't, I didn't even think of it. So I, yeah, the, let, let's encourage everyone to, to, to find more ways to, to give your money and your time and your talent away and, and find the joy and the, the blessing in that. 
Well, that is a perfect note to end on. So let's um, just thank Scott Harrison for the lifetime work that you have done. And thanks to Charity Water for being such a great partner. And we are with you. Uh, we're behind you. We're following you. And you have all of our support. So thanks, Scott. Awesome. Thanks for your friendship and believing in us many years ago. Thanks, everybody, for listening. God bless you.